Interested to like zoom in on your <laughs> you never know. We have science students, so they might be yeah. Little, yeah crazy. So we're just about to record a, a, an episode with Dr. Karen Mulak. Say hello, Karen. Hello. Um, so we're going to talk about learning languages, and uh, actually, we're in this really cool room. What's it, what's it called? So this is an anechoic chamber. Um, it's just it's a very heavily padded room, um, with, and the effect is that. All of the sound that you produce or that is produced has nothing to bounce off of. So it's just, it's very, very quiet. <laughs> These are the sort of rooms that you probably have seen on the internet where people have claimed to have uh, had hallucinations and have gone crazy for staying, what, 45 minutes or, yeah. or longer? I, 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 did, I do recall seeing um, an article saying that no one's been able to stay in an anechoic chamber more than 45 minutes. We just, uh, we're about to do an hour, so... High five to that. <laughs> there you go. Just to know hallucinations. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. We may just come out all crazy, you know, like we're on LSD. Who knows? <laughs> cool. This is our adult eye tracking room. Um, so what we do here is we'll, again, play some stimuli on the screen. It all involves stimuli on the screen. Um, participants will rest their chin right here. And this is our eye tracker. What it does is it... Uh, shoots, you know, shoot. It's, it's not like a laser shooting, but it will place an infrared light um, into the eye. So you can't actually, your eye can't um, detect this. So you don't even, it doesn't feel like there's lights shining in your eye or anything. And um, that light though will reflect off of the back of your eye. And the eye tracker will measure um, kind of where the light went in versus where it's come out. And by using that um, angle, it can detect where on the screen you're looking. Mm -hmm. So um, we can do uh, things such as look at uh, what words are maybe activated as you're listening to a word. So for instance, if you hear um, the, the string of speech catalog, um, if we put like a picture of a cat up, picture of a catalog, a picture of cattle, for instance, and you know, maybe a dog or something. Um, what we would see is that just as the speech signal unfolds, as you just hear the cat, then people will start looking more to the cat image. Um, as it continues on with the ol, they'll look at the cat image less and start looking more at cattle. Um, and eventually we'll look more, more at um, catalogs. So that tells us about lexical processing. Mm, that's interesting. Um, this is just the one that we use for doing um, our auditory recordings. So when we just need speech, um, but we don't need video. So like the anechoic chamber, it's, it's quiet in here. It's not as quiet, but um, it's still pretty dampened. Mm -hmm. So we can get nice, clear stimuli. This is our opposite track. Um, what you do here is you put these sensors onto the face. I mean, this is just... These are thumbtacks. We don't actually put thumbtacks into your face. But um, this shows like where they would go. And um, what the person does is w we use this to kind of measure where the, um, how the face moves when you're talking in that. So you would uh, like say a word and this OptiTrack would flash um, onto you and it would just record where all of these markers are. Mm, okay. Oh, this is nice. Yes. Colorful. Thank you. It's a toy. Hi. So this is our um, infant eye tracking room. It has the same eye tracker. It's it's pretty much the same as our adult one, mm -hmm. um, except we don't have the infants uh, rest their head on a on a chin rest. So with this 
um, eye tracker, there's kind of like a, a 30 centimeter cube that the infant can wiggle all around in where it'll still track their eye movements. Um, and infants tend to be sitting on their parents' lab. Yeah. Lap. Yep, always. Um, yeah, the parents are always, always with the infants. Or grandma or whoever brought them in. All right. So is 19 months uh, kind of the limit of, of the age of kids that you work with, or does it go after that as well? Um, most of our studies end about that age, but not, not always. So um, like there's one PhD student who's testing like school-aged kids as well. Okay. Um, but yeah, the majority are within the first two years. And this room is? Yeah, so this is, um, we do like a, a preferential looking um, exp uh, experiments in here. And so that is just kind of working off of the assumption that infants will look at, look more to things that they like more or things that they prefer more. So um, for instance, there was one study in here looking at um, children's attention to audiovisual speech so what it had is it had um, it had a face, except so the face was just um, points that um, that moved. So they had been recorded from someone's original face, but we were just looking at the points rather than any features about the person's face. And um, we would play uh, like some sentences to the infant. And so the one on say the one on the left matched. Um, so it was moving in sync with, with what they were hearing, whereas the other one didn't. And so we just wanted to see if infants are actually paying attention to the, to the movement. And um, by that token, we would expect them to look more at the um, condition that was matched than the one that was mismatched. Mm, okay, that's interesting. Um, so this is a room where we look at mother's infant-directed speech to infants. So the mom will sit here with their child there. And we give them these very specific objects to play with. Um, and you see we have images with these, with these kinds of objects on there as well. This is so that we get the same vowels from everyone in the same context. So we have shark, shoe, and sheep. So we have all we have three different vowels, and they're all preceded by an sh sound, um, because the way a vowel is produced can be affected by the consonant that comes before it. So we want to keep that con that uh, constant throughout. And um, yeah, we just measure how um, parents' vowels when they speak to babies differs compared to when they speak to adults, because the evidence shows that. When we're speaking to babies, we really exaggerate the vowels. Mm. Um, and that's to make it easier for the for the child to distinguish one word from another? Is that the, is that the it's, idea? Yeah, it's, so that's still up for debate why we do it. Um, but yeah, some people think that it does help the infants to um, learn the, the vowels and learn, learn the words. Um, other people think, or they think in addition, that it just kind of draws their attention um, just more generally to what they're saying. Okay. Our adult EEG room. Um, so we have participants um, sit in here and, you know, we play them um, different things on the screen, ask them to push buttons. While they are doing all of this, we are reading their brain waves. So we have them put on this cap here, and we take these electrodes here and um, plug them in, and um, it will measure the, uh, as you think and as your brain does anything, it's producing um, electrical activity, and so this will read the electrical activity and can tell us things such as, um, whether you can tell the difference between two sounds, um, even without 
consciously being aware of it. Mm, interesting. It's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. The, we have a, a similar system where we just put the cap on the baby and then we can read their brain waves. Um, which that sounds like we're reading their thoughts and that, but it's it's much lower level than that. But EEG, it's great with kids because it's something um, that you, that um, it's subconscious. So the kids, they're they will always give us the same kinds of data as adults. So it makes it easy to compare between infants and adults. Um, the difficult thing with EEG with infants is that. It can take time to get the cap on, and sometimes they don't want to wear the cap. And so we have lots of toys in here to just try and distract them and keep them interested while they get all set up with that bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to thank you for your time, Karen. I, yeah, thank, you. thank you for the tour and for the conversation. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Yeah, me as well. It was fun. Cool. Uh, one last thing. If students are interested in working with you, how, sh how should they uh, go on? Uh, what, what should they do to get in contact with you? Um, yeah, probably the easiest thing would just be to shoot me an email. Um, you can find my email address on the website or it's k.mulak. If you can't find it on Google, don't be a researcher. <laughs> yeah, it's a good, it's a good filter. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Blab Coats. Rate and review our podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast, because it does help us spread the word. And if you like what we're doing here, then help us grow it by sharing this with a friend, a friend of a friend, or your mailman, even your mailman's mailman. We also want to hear from you, so send us questions or comments to blabcoats at gmail.com. And if you have any interesting questions or comments, then we'll talk about it on air.